ask that you would get a hold of your Bibles, your Nooks, your Kindles, whatever electronic devices you have that house the Word of God, that we might uh, lift them up in the air and declare what we believe God will do through the sharing of His Word uh, this morning, two, three. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. If I hear it with my ears, I'll believe it in my heart. Amen. As you remain standing, turn with me to that wonderful uh, book of pose and poetry as well, uh, the book of Ruth, uh, chapter number one, uh, verses six through 21. I'll be reading from the NIV version this morning, uh, the book of Ruth, chapter one. Uh, verse number 6 through 21. And there you'll find these interesting words recorded. And when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. And with two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And when Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, and even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. And at this they wept aloud again, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my God, and your God, my God. And where you die, I die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious and almighty God, for this another great and glorious opportunity you have given us to share in your word, we thank you and we praise you and Lord, we pray that you'd open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear, soften the soil of our hearts that we might be receptive to the seeds that you desire to plant in them. And furthermore, Lord, help us not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers as well. And now, Lord, may we be revealed in the truth of thy word, in the precious and in the holy name of Jesus, we do pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. And we're going to ask that the hostesses will allow folks to trickle in from the back. Um, we're going to ask that we just adjust this mic just a little bit more, if you would, if you would adjust it, um, as we allow for folks to trickle in from the back. If you could adjust this just a bit more, that would be 
wonderful. Amen. Look at the person sitting next to you and just tell them, it's just life. It's just life. Look at somebody else and tell them, it's just life. I want to talk to you uh, from the subject this morning. It's just life. It's, it's just life. <clears throat> if you are a lover of books, literature and reading, you are already very much aware of the wonderful narrative behind the enchanting story of Ruth. Uh, disparate from many of the other biblical books, the book of Ruth doesn't read with deep theological underpinnings, but rather it reads like a best-selling New York Times novel sprinkled with doses of ear-tingling poetry and prose. It is a well-written piece of literature whose characters, after just a few pages, we've fallen madly in love with. We become involved with their fears, with their affairs, and we feel their pain, and we shed their tears. This is a unique but an eclectic story. It's a story of death, of tragedy, of family, of love, of loyalty, of human relationships, of survival and redemption wrapped up all into one. It is a story of tenacious women who were intransigent in their desire to survive. Equally, it is the story of quixotic men who extended themselves beyond themselves in the name of chivalry and mobility. It is the story of genealogy in which we see the seedlings of everything from Israel's future greatest king to the world's long awaited Messiah. It is allegorical in nature in the sense that we see the main characters paralleling the historical triangle of Israel, the church, um, and Christ. Naomi being the symbol of Israel, Ruth being the symbol of the church, and Boaz being the symbol of Christ. It is a story of universal appeal in the sense that both the sinner and the saint, the educated and the uneducated, the rich and the poor, can relate to this anthropomorphic journey. In large measure, it is a story like no other, whose intricately woven tapestry of tragedy, misfortune, love, and grief teach us the hard lesson that some experiences are just a part of life. And, and this text speaks to us today about this same subject, the subject of certain events and circumstances being just a part of life. But, but before we're properly introduced to the protagonists of this story, uh, 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 upon the raising of the curtains for the opening uh, of the drama, we're blindsided in the very first verse with this disheartening news that there's a famine in the land, meaning the land of Israel, Bethlehem. And that's why verse 1 reports, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now, it's interesting to note the glaring irony that exists here, that a famine had spilled over into Bethlehem, even though, the, even though the name Bethlehem literally means house of bread. But nevertheless, although, uh, although famines were bad, they were fairly commonplace throughout all of the New Testament narratives. In fact, we read of famines occurring all through, episodically, throughout the Old Testament. Uh, 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 everyone from Joseph and his brothers to Elijah and the widow and to even the lepers who sat outside the city gate. And the list goes on and on of all of the famines that we see sprinkled out throughout, New, uh, throughout Old Testament literature. So famines were no surprise surprise during this era, especially during the area of the judges, which is when this book was written. But despite its prevalence, it was still a big deal 
Because what it meant was that there wasn't any rain falling for an extended period of time in Bethlehem. So crops dried up. Farm animals that produced food had nothing to drink. Humans had no water to drink or to bathe in. So the whole economy, as well as the lives of the people in that community, were in jeopardy, all because a famine had struck the land. And although this, was, this famine was devastating, the reality was is that famines were simply a natural part of life back then. The famines came and went. They were an integral part of, uh, of the life cycle back in the Old Testament. Famines, although devastating, were normal. They were a part of life in the Old Testament. You see, and that brings us to point number one. You see, the reality is, is that fam whether we realize it or not, uh, famines are just a natural part of life. Whether we realize it or not, is that famines are just a natural part of, of life. And, and, and you know what a famine is. A, a famine is that season in life when there's no rain falling. And as a result, things are just drying up. It's a famine. It's a season of drought. It's a season where there's no productivity. It's a season where nothing is growing or flourishing. It's a season when stuff is just drying up. It's called a famine. And whether we realize it or not, famines come in many different venues of our lives. Sometimes famines come in the form uh, you know, of our finances. And other times, famines come in the form of our careers. Other times, famines come in the form of marriage relationships. And sometimes, they come in the form of friendships. Uh, that, that business that you used to be bustling over with customers uh, uh, that now barely has enough customer pace base to pay its bills. It, 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 it's what happens when you're in a famine. That, that marriage that used to be filled with passion and romance is now nothing but a dull, lackluster, killjoy arrangement. It's, it's, it's what happens when you're in a famine. Uh, that career that you used to be find exciting and, stimula and stimulating is now nothing but a banal, pedestrian, mundane, weekly routine. That's what happens when you're in a famine. That bank account that used to be in the overflow is now stuck in the underflow of insufficient funds. It's what happens uh, when you're in a famine. Because when you're in a famine, just like with crops, everything dries up. The money drives up. Customers drive up. Uh, uh, um, um, the, the romance dries up, spiritual favor, uh, fervor dries up. And the thing about famines is that in, in certain geographical areas, they're just a natural part of the ecosystem. They're an, they're, they're, they're an integral part of the ecological process. In other words, their occurrence has nothing to do with what anyone has said or done, but, but just by default, it's naturally a part of life cycle. And so it is with most famines that you and I endure. Most famines have nothing to do uh, with anything you and I have said or done, but rather they're just a natural part of the life cycle. Uh, when things dried up in your career and you lost interest, that so much interest that you thought it was because of something you did or didn't do. But has it ever occurred to you that it was just a natural part of the life cycle? When, when, when the romance died in your relationship and you thought it was because of something you didn't do or something perhaps that you did do, but has it ever occurred to you uh, that maybe you hit that famine because it was just a natural part of the life cycle? Uh, when your money got tight and you were no longer living in the overflow and you thought of it was because of something you did, but has it ever occurred to you that maybe it was just part of the life cycle? So for those of you who have sort of masochistic tendencies in the sense that you tend to beat up on yourself because of the different famines you're facing. I've come to tell you, stop beating up on yourself because it was probably just a natural part of the life cycle. Uh, so, so, so what do you do when you're in a famine? What do you do when stuff is all dried up? What do you do when everything is drying up around you in your life as they experienced here uh, uh, in Bethlehem? Well, it's, it's interesting to examine what Elimelech did in response to the famine in the life uh, of he and his family. And it's found right there at the end of verse 2. Notice what the text says. It says, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. 
And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. So notice what Elimelech did not do. He did not stay in Bethlehem. He, he didn't do that. He didn't just sit there and complain. No, he, he didn't do that. He did not just sit there and just say, well, I'm just going to wait it out and see what happens. No, 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 no. But instead, he packed up his wife, Naomi, and the kids, loaded up the Ford Explorer, and moved to Noab, Moab, where there was, where there was plenty. So Elimelech dealt with the famine by moving someplace else. And you see, that brings us to point number two. Sometimes the best way to deal with a famine is to simply move someplace else. I think I need to say that again. Sometimes the best way to deal with a famine is to simply move someplace else. You see, the mistake some of us make when we're in a famine is we stay in the famine. If our career is in famine, we stay right in that same place of our career. We just stay in the famine. If our finances are in a famine, we stay right there in the same place, dealing with money the same way you, we always deal with it. We just stay in the famine. If our marriage is in a famine, we stay right there in that same way of relating and dealing with each other, making no changements or adjustments, just hoping things will get better. We stay in the famine. If our spiritual life is in a famine, we stay right where we are, in the same place in terms of how we're connecting with God. Uh, maybe in the same church, doing the same things that are not really working. We stay, are you with me, in the famine. And when, then we wonder why stuff stays all dried up. But the way to deal with a famine is to move someplace else. In other words, you've got to move to Moab. That's why if I'm experiencing a famine in my career, I can't afford to just stay doing what I've always done. But I've got to try to do something else to jumpstart it so it's better. I've got to move to Moab. That's why if I'm experiencing a famine in my finances, I can't afford to keep handling money the same way I've been handling, running up charge cards, getting into debt. I've got to try something new. I've got to move to Moab. That's why if I'm experiencing a famine in my spiritual life, I can't afford to you know, continue not praying and not having quiet times and staying in the same old church doing the same old thing. You know, I, but I've got to try something else. I've got to move to Moab. That's why if I'm experiencing famine in my marriage, I can't afford to just stay relating to myself the same old way that I've been relating to him or her. But I've got to get counseling. I've got to read some books. I've got to figure out how to make this thing work. I've got to move to Moab. Look at your neighbor and tell him, sometimes you've got to move to Moab. Yeah, I, 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 I love the famed Old Testament story of the four lepers who were sitting out the city gate. You, you remember that story. On one side of them was their homeland, Israel, that was stricken with a terrible famine and people were dying left and right. And on the other side of them was the enemy camp of the Syrians who had just raided Israel. So caught between two undesirable circumstances, famine on one and enemies on the other side, they had been sitting there for what appeared to be days trying to figure out what they should do and they're just sitting there doing nothing until finally one leper comes to his senses and has an epiphany of sorts and he says wait a minute brothers wait a minute why sit here y'all not gonna pray with me and perish he says, let's just go over to the enemy's camp and take our chances there. It's a risk, but it's better than sitting here and dying as a result of the famine. And you see, the denouement, which is the French word for the conclusion of this story, is that when they took a risk by moving away from the famine into the enemy's camp, uh, they survived and even flourished because God had already cleared the camp of their enemies for them. And you see, and as it was with those lepers, so it needs to be with some of us. Sometimes some of us have been sitting in a famine for 5, 10, 15, 25, and even 30 years now. And the question that you need to be asking yourself is, why sit here in parish? Yeah, why, why sit in this dried up career in parish? Why sit in this dried up financial situation and parish? Why sit uh, in this dried up marriage, marriage and parish? Why sit in this dried up life and I'm in perish but instead you've got to get moving you've got to get to moving into another direction in other words you, you can't just sit there and wait for the famine to devour you but you've got to start moving in another direction where there's a new mindset where there's a new approach where there's a new way of doing things where there's new vision there's fresh vision there's a fresh understanding you've got to request a change for a new position get a financial advisor start seeing a marriage counselor go back to school take 
take some anger management courses. Go see a career counselor. In other words, don't just sit there in the famine. Do something. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't just sit there. Do something. Because the man, the, the idea is that so many believers have been sitting in famines for years and just waiting for it to take them out. But, but then it's interesting to examine another key event in the life of this family that adds to the idea of some things qualifying as just life. And it's found in verses 3 to 5 of that same text. Notice what the text says. It says, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with two sons. Now they took wives of the woman of Moab, and the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malan and Chilion, Naomi's sons, died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Now what's so disturbing about this story is that instead of things getting better for Naomi, they're getting absolutely unequivocally worse. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation where instead of things getting better, they're just getting worse? Well, well, this is how it was for her. It was just getting worse. It was bad enough that she had to flee a famine. And then not too long after they arrived to Moab, her husband dies. And then 10 years later, both of her sons, Malan and Chilion, die, who recently got married. They die. Now, the text does not indicate what they died from. Uh, we, we don't know whether they died from malaria or whether they died from leprosy or whether they died from some virulent or, or pernicious disease. But all we know is that they died. And, and, and watch this, when we do an etymological study uh, uh, of the, her son's names, the death of her sons don't really strike us as a surprise. You see, because the, the, the Hebrew word uh, for Malan literally means sickly. And then Chilion, the other son in the Hebrew, his name means failing. And so given the ominous meanings of their names, be careful what you name your children. <laughs> and so given the ominous meanings of their names, although young, it is no wonder that they all died. They all died. Every man that Naomi ever loved up and died on her. Uh, and so within a short span of time, Naomi is struck with three deaths of all the men in her life. It is a grim scene. But thankfully, she's not alone. Because left to share in her grief, left to commiserate with her, are her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah, who are also grieving over the death of their husbands. And so we get this sort of melancholic picture of these three grief-stricken grief widows all huddled together. All of whom lost, uh, all of them whom have lost their husbands. All of whom lost somebody precious to, us, to them. All of whom were inundated with emptiness and pain and grief. And, 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 and isn't it interesting to know that, that there's something about death that can bring the most unlikely people together. There's something about the sting of loss that could bring the most disparate people with disparate personalities together. It's what Shakespeare's Trinkolo was talking about when he says misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. You see, there's something about death that will link the most unlikely pairs together, crossing every boundary from age to stage to gender to race to ethnicity and culture and on and on. But after all of this death and after all of the funerals and after all of the mourning and the weeping and the grieving and the crying if there's one thing that Naomi had learned from this experience it was simply this that death was just a natural part of life you see and th th that brings us to point number three uh, whether you realize it or not death <laughs> uh, unfortunately is just a natural part of life I think I need to say that again whether we realize it or not death is just a natural part of life. Oh, what a vexing, disconcerting point this is. Because it's such a dark and grim and melancholic notion, isn't it? Being, death being a natural part of life. And, and, and what a 
whatever happened to some of the more joyful ideologies of life that the Bible gives us? You know, concepts like, I have come that you might have life and it more abundantly. You know, concept Lord, like, the Lord is the strength of my life. You know, concepts like, with long life, he will satisfy me. But the notion of death being a natural part of life, I'm sure you will agree with me, is a bummer. It's a downer. It is in no way encouraging. Because that, uh, besides that, the notion of itself is paradoxical. Because when we typically think of life and death, we see them as polar opposites, that, at, that at being at extreme opposites of the existential spectrum. But this text reminds us that, that, that they're, just not, they're not just at our opposite ends, but they're mixed in together. Uh, so as much as we hate to hear it, I hate to tell you, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, that death is indeed a natural part of life. In other words, death is an innate part of the cycle of life. It plays an integral role of the process of life. It is an essential component of life. It is interdependent of life. And whether we realize it or not, death comes dressed in all shapes and forms. Uh, yeah, sometimes people die. Other times animals die. Some Sometimes businesses die. Sometimes relationships die. Other times visions die. Sometimes dreams die. Other times interests and concepts die. Uh, and if the truth be told, most of us here today have had some kind of death in our life in one way or the other. Oh, you don't hear me this morning. You know, and I don't mean just when mama died or daddy died or grandma died, but we've also endured some other kinds of death. Some of us have had businesses to die that you worked hard to build, but sooner after a year or two, you had to put a born out of business sign on the front door. That was a death. Others of us have had long-term relationships to go right down the drain. You tore up all his pictures, burned his clothes, and now you won't even speak his name that was a death. Others of us have had dreams to be extinguished, lofty goals and, ex and aspirations that you used to nurse, that you no longer, that no longer live in your soul. That was a death. Some of us have had close relationships to die. After many years of being close, going places, sharing intimate details of your lives together, after one big fight, one big misunderstanding, it was all shot dead, and now you haven't spoken in years. That was was a death. You see, and in most cases, it's not because of anything we thought, said, or have done. It's just a natural part of life. You see, sometimes when I'm driving up Route 13 on my way to New York or New Jersey, somewhere between the Virginia state line and the Maryland state line, there's about a quarter mile stretch of dead forestry. Nothing but dead trees with no leaves bending over. It's just an eerie scene of death that somehow life sucked the, the, uh, the life out of all of these trees. Um, it's kind of an eerie sight when you pass it. On one occasion, uh, while I was at a gas station, I struck up a conversation with an old man, and as we were talking, I just you know, parenthetically mentioned that stretch of dead forestry. And when I casually mentioned that horrific sight, uh, and, and being that he moved, that, that he lived in that area, and I mentioned that, he said, oh, oh, that stretch of forestry? He says, oh, no, it's not always like that. He says, but every two or three years, it dies. And then the next year later, it replenishes itself with all of this beautiful growth, and then it dies again. He says, it's strange. He says, but death just seems to be a part of that forest life. You see, and as it is with the stretch of forestry, so it is with the dynamics of our lives. Death just seems to be part of life. It's just life. Now, if you have an inquiring mind, you'll say, but why? Well, why is it? Why is it that death has to be a natural part of life? Why does it have to be this way? Well, the Danish existentialist philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard, he put it like this. He put it in the most simplest words. He said, quote, in order for something to be born, something else has to die. He said, in order for something to be born, something else has to die. You see, on the African Sahara, when National Geographic Wild shows its graphic footage of the big cats preying on the wildebeest, the kudus, and the gazelles, what the narrator will invariably point out is that in order for these cats to live, some of the gazelles must die. In fact, the narrator often goes as far as to say that in order for, uh, for new cats to be born, some of the gazelles have to die. 
You see, and as it is with life on the African Sahara, so it is with life on the human Sahara. And in order for something to be born, something has to die. You see, the US Census Bureau maintains a population clock which has an up-to-date minute resident population count. They estimate that there is one birth every seven seconds and one death every 13 seconds. So this means that for almost every two births, there has to be one death to balance out the cycle of life. Kierkegaard was right. In order for something to be born, something has to, has to die. In, you know, in order for room to be made, something new has, has got to die. You see, I know you didn't want that business, you, you know, I, that business that you worked on hard so, you know, uh, to die. I know that you didn't, want, you didn't want that business to die. But in order for God to birth a new business in your, a, new, a better and a new business in your life, that old business had to die. You see, I know that we didn't want that dysfunctional drama filled relationship with that crazy man to die but in order for God to bring you into a new normal healthy relationship with a godly man it had to die you see I know you didn't want that coveted dream that just wasn't materializing to die but in order for God to build a new dream that uh, that has a new plan for your life and that it really identifies with God's will for your life it had to die I know that you may not have wanted that close friendship that really had no point point or purpose in your life to die but in order for God to build a new friendship in your life that had purpose and meaning and value and substance that old relationship had to die you see because if nothing ever dies in my life then I'll never see anything new in my life if the sun never sets in my life then I'll never see it rise in my life if the winter never comes in my life then I'll never see the blossoming of a new spring in my life if the leaf never falls in my life, then I'll never see the, the, the blooming of a new tree in my life. If the waves never break in my life, then I'll never see a new shoreline in my life. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to this afternoon, but in order for your life to stay fresh, sometimes things have to die. In order for a new vision to come, the old one's got to die. In order for a new relationship to bud, a new one, you know, the old one has to die. In order for a new dream to be realized, you know, uh, the old one's got to die. In other words, if you want something fresh and new to happen in your life, sometimes God says, we've got to let the cycle of what wasn't working in your life go ahead and die. But the problem some of us are having is that we've been holding on to some dead stuff that died years ago. Yeah, I, I love the story. Uh, uh, there used to be uh, a program on TLC, and it was called uh, Strange Addictions. And they had uh, a, a, f a feature story of a young man who, uh, 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 who lived with his mother well into his 50s, and finally one day his mother died. And instead of calling the ambulance, and instead of calling the undertaker, he just let her sit there. And he propped her up. In the, on the dining room table and he got up for breakfast each morning and ate his porridge while he spoke to his mother and then at night he would take her rigor mortis ridden body and put it in bed and kiss her on the head and then go in and sleep and then the next morning he'd wake up and then he'd put her back at the kitchen table and, and, and finally uh, the neighbors after, after uh, you know, a couple of weeks began to really smell a pungent odor and stench and they called the authorities on him. And, 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 um, and uh, when the authorities said to him, how long has she been dead? He says, well, about two weeks now. And, and they said to him, well, why, why didn't you call us? And he just said, I just couldn't let her go. Even though she was gone, I just couldn't let her go. And this is where some folk are today. Things have been dead for 10, 15, 25, and 30 years. And we've been still holding on to dead relationships that have been long gone. We've been holding on to dead situations that have been long gone. Dead jobs, dead careers, dead friendships, dead ways of doing things. We're holding on to dead careers that flatlined years ago. Dead relationships that were gone years ago. Dead dreams that God pronounced the benediction on years ago. Dead relationships that hit an impasse years ago. And then you're wondering why nothing new is happening in your life. Uh, because you got too much dead. You got to get the dead out before God can bring something new and living in. 
But hear me when I tell you that if it's dead, it's dead. And once it's dead, you need to bury it for something new to come springing up in your life. Look at your neighbor and tell him, if it's dead, bury it. But, but, but lastly, it's compelling to explore how Naomi deals with the grim and tragic occurrences in her life. And it's found in verse 20. Uh, you see, after the mourning over the deaths of her husband and sons, and after hearing uh, that the famine had ended in her hometown of Bethlehem, Naomi decides that she's had enough of living in Moab. Nothing but bad luck there. So she decides she's had enough. She's dealt with enough pain. She's gone through enough heartache. Her heart has been broken. And so now she decides, well, I'm going on home. And, and you remember the poignant scene of her daughter-in-law's Ruth and Orpah weeping as they said to her, they said, okay, don't go alone. We'll, we'll go with you. We'll, we'll go with you back to your people. But you remember the practical words of a very wise Naomi at that time. Remember her words. She says, no, my daughters, you go back. I have nothing left to give you. I have no more sons in my womb to give you. I'm too old to get remarried and have children again. And even if I could can see, what are you going to do? Are you going to wait till my new sons grow up, you know, uh, you know, and marry them and, and, and hold off getting married again? No, girls, you have your whole lives ahead of you. Stay here where you can start new. And so she tells them, no, you, you got to stay. And you remember the story of how Ruth gives this uh, moving speech about her not allowing her mother-in-law to return to her homeland. <clears throat> and remember, she, she says, no, uh, Orpah, Orpah leaves. But Ruth says, no, I can't leave you. I, I can't abandon mama. And, and, and you remember the, the, the poetic and poignant words that she says to her mother-in-law. She says, listen, I'm not going anywhere. For where you go, I will go. And where you large, I will lodge and your people shall be my people and your God will be my God. I mean, Ruth just wouldn't and couldn't live without Naomi. In fact, her connection to her mother-in-law was so strong that it reminds me of the one of the poignant words of Gladys Knight's fame song, Midnight Train in Georgia. You remember those words where she wrote, he's leaving. Y'all not going to pray with me on the midnight train to Georgia. And he's going back to a simpler place and time. And I'll be with him on that midnight train to Georgia. And watch this, this is deep. She says, and I'd rather live in his world than live without him in mine. Y'all haven't been saved all your life. And I mean, if there was ever anyone serious about sticking with someone, uh, you know, uh, it was Ruth. She could identify with the words of this song. But, but conversely, Orper left. She walked away. The other and daughter said, well, if you set me free, if that's the way you want it, I'm going on home. I'm going to stay with my people. And Naomi, and when Orpah decided to leave, watch this, Naomi let her go. Listen, when people can walk away from you, let them go. When people can walk out on you, let them go. Because your destiny is only tied to folk who will stay with you, not those who leave you. So if they want to go, for goodness sake, let them go. Don't you dare beg another man to stay with you. Don't you dare plead with another woman to stay in your home don't you dare try to convince somebody who no longer loves you to leave if they decide to leave let them leave somebody's going to get liberated this morning if they really loved you and they were committed to you they wouldn't be trying to leave you learn to say goodbye learn to say au revoir wash your face fix your hair do your dance and keep it moving let them go look at your neighbor and tell them let them go hmm And so Ruth, Ruth journeys back to her hometown of Bethlehem. She packs up the saddle, 
gets on a mule with all of her things, and when she gets back, all the city is excited to see her. It's almost like a king's return. And all the Bible says right there uh, in the verse, it says that all the women, when they saw Naomi, they didn't give her the cold shoulder. But the Bible declares that with great passion and ebullience, they begin to shout, it's Naomi, it's Naomi. Let me give you the, the, the turn in translation. They said, girl, we haven't seen you in 10 years. We're so glad to have sister girl back. Now, you would think that she would have relished and basked in this wonderful reception that she received from these people. But as I pointed out last week, look at how Naomi responds in verse 20. Uh, it says, but she said to them, don't call me Naomi, uh, but call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt, all, uh, has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home empty again. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Do you notice what Naomi calls herself? First of all, she rejects their praise. She says, no, 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 no. Notice what she calls herself. She says, don't call me Naomi. I'm, I'm done with that name. Call me Mara. And Mara in the Hebrew, as I shared with you last week, translates as bitter. And so what she was in effect saying was that she was bitter. She was bitter woman, bitter from her tragic circumstances, bitter from the famine, bitter from the death of her husband, bitter from the death of her two sons, bitter that things didn't work out when she left one country to another. She ended up having to come back empty. Now, it's one thing if other people call you bitter, but it's another thing when you call yourself bitter. And so although a survivor, Ruth has allowed the natural misfortunes of her life to make her absolutely downright, categorically, unequivocally bitter. And you see, that brings us to the last point as we close out. Listen, never allow misfortunes of life to make you bitter. I think I need to put that on rewind this morning. Never allow the misfortunes of life to make you bitter. You see, the mistake some of us have made is that we have allowed life's misfortunes to make us bitter. Yeah, ever since we were mistreated as a child, some of us have been bitter. Ever since you got laid off from the job, some of us have been bitter. Ever since the divorce, you've been bitter. Ever since he walked out on you and on the kids and left you having to fend for yourself, you've been bitter. Ever since mama's death, you've been bitter. Ever since you, your ex got remarried to some other woman, you've been bitter. And this, of course, explains why some of us are walking around looking like we do with our eyes all crossed. Our lips all poked out, always short and abrupt with people, always with an attitude, always something smart to say, always irascible and cantankerous. In fact, some of us are so bitter that we act like a burnt cat who's been kicked through an electric fan. And what's interesting to note is that what bitter will do, you see, whether we realize it or not, bitterness will transform the sweetest, kindest, gentleness, most benign people in the world into some of the most mean people in the world. Some of us used to be sweet and loving and kind and gentle and blithe and cheerful and chipper, uh, you know, uh, until bitterness got a hold of us. And now some of us are just downright bitter. Bitter because somebody died. Bitter because you lost your job. Bitter because of the divorce. Bitter because we were abused when we were growing up. Bitter because you were raped as a child. Bitter because you got locked up. Bitter because somebody took your child. Bitter because your man cheated on you. Bitter because somebody betrayed you. Bitter because somebody abandoned you. Bitter because life has kicked you around like a World Cup soccer ball. And now you've become a bitter old man or middle-aged woman and that nobody wants to be around. And like Naomi, you might as well change your name. Instead of saying, hello, my name is Mark, just say, hello, my name is Mara, my name is Bitter. 
But the devil is a liar. Never allow life circumstances to make you bitter. You see, God didn't save you from your sins for you to walk around like a burnt cat. You see, Jesus didn't hang, bleed, and die on the cross for you to walk around all bitter up. You see, he didn't come, you know, you didn't, Jesus didn't come for you to have life and it more abundantly, for you to walk around like you're angry at the world. You, you see, Jesus didn't come to, to you, for you to be a part of the kingdom of God for you to be walking around all bitter but it's quiet but it's quite to the contrary in other words it's quite to the contrary because the Bible says that if you're saved the joy of the Lord should be your strength that if you're saved you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light the Bible says that if if you are saved, uh, you shall be the head and not the tail. You shall be the lender and not the borrower. In other words, if you're saved, bitter should not be your name, but joy should be your name. Somebody shout, I got joy. Despite my pain, joy. Despite my anguish, joy. Despite my, my loss, joy. Despite my heartache, joy. Despite being broke, joy. Despite being unemployed, joy. Despite my tears joy I shall be joy listen if you've ever had a grapefruit by itself you've probably noticed that it's one of the most bitter foods you can eat you see, but despite its bitterness, however, grapefruits are filled with chock full of traditional nutritional value. So when I was a kid, in order to get me to eat this fruit, my mother would uh, put it in front of me, and after she would see the adverse look on my face, she would take two spoonfuls of sugar, and then she would just sprinkle it all over that grapefruit. Uh, and what my mother would sprinkle this, you know, and much to my delight, uh, it would totally transform this bitter, sour fruit into a tasty treat that ate just as sweet as a strawberry or banana. So just a little sugar changed the most bitter fruit into a sweet treat that rivaled the best of them. And I've just come to tell some bitter folk this morning that I know you, I, that I know what you need. If you're bitter this morning, I know what you need. All you need is just a little sugar to transform you into one of God's sweetest treats. And you know what sugar I'm talking about. You know what sugar that is. One hymn writer described it like this. He sang, tis so sweet, my God to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. Another writer described the sugar like this. He sang every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And then another writer looked at it and put it like this. She wrote, he's sweet. Oh my God. I know. He's sweet. I know. Dark clouds may rise. Strong winds may blow. But I'll tell the world wherever I go that I found a savior and he's sweet. I know. In other words, if you're bitter today, all you need is a little more Jesus to sweeten you up. A little more prayer. A little more word. A little more praise. A little more grace. A little more peace. A little more mercy. A little more presence. Look at your neighbor and tell him, just give me a little more Jesus. Somebody shout yeah. The doors of this church are open. Maybe you're here this